All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another live stream from the Scalar Learning Channel, and we are one day away from SAT test day, which is tomorrow. And if you haven't seen it yet, we just dropped a huge video earlier this morning, which is solving the 38 hardest digital SAT math problems. And uh, that took me a lot of time. I was up till two in the morning last night and then got up early again today to to uh, finish it off for everybody by tomorrow. So make sure to check that out. It's all time stamped and you can see where I pulled each problem from, which practice test, uh, which module, et cetera. And by the way, when I have the modules listed as module two in that video, those are obviously the, the harder versions of, of module two. What's up, Jacob? What's up, uh, Sunvi? All right, so let's talk about my math question predictions. Now, here's the thing. Since the last May SAT, all right, we haven't seen... Um, we haven't seen a release of any new practice tests or anything like that. So we're going to have a lot of similarities in terms of my May predictions. Um, but I'm going to go through the, the prominent problems that I've see, been seeing popping up, especially more, more specifically on, on practice tests five and six. That's what I'm using to basically inform my predictions about what I think you're going to likely see tomorrow. And, but, you know, you're going to see a lot of the same, right? You're going to see algebraic questions, system of equations. All of that's going to be standard. But what I'm focusing on in particular are the, the strange ones that are going to be on the tougher side and the ones that I, th you know, how I think the College Board is attempting to improve and basically modify the test in real time to make it, you know, better test. All right. So without further ado, let's do it. What's up, Yusuf? All right. So first of all, systems of equations without X and Y. The reason why I think they're going to do this is because it's going to make it a little bit tougher to rely solely on Desmos. I still believe that the College Board is now perhaps feeling like uh, allowing Desmos for the entire test maybe took away some of the ability that, for the test to kind of look at particular skills of like, hey, how do I do this, that, the other? Because you could just literally plug in a system of equations into Desmos verbatim. You don't have to do anything and you can, you can solve it right there on the graph. So I think they're now using these alternate variables. Now, if you want, you can still swap them with X and Y, set R equal to X, you know, W equal to Y, because it says P is your constant, you could still plug it in and do your thing um, and, and figure this out. But, you know, another way you could do this as well, if you want to do it by hand algebraically, is think about it. P is your is your constant. That's basically like your slope. So you'd want to still do the same thing, isolate. And when they talk about no solutions, we need to have same slope, different y-intercept. So whatever the P value is or whatever your slope is on the top one and, and the bottom, set them equal to each other and solve for P that way. Okay. So this is something that I definitely think is going to be popping up. Now we're talking about rational functions. This is another one. This is from practice test six, this rational functions question. Actually, I solved it in the 38 hardest questions video. So I'd make sure to check that out if you want to see me do this in real time. But this is an interesting one because it it is a rational function. It does involve an asymptote at negative three. But it's also like it's stacking a linear on top of a rational. I thought this one was really interesting. But again, I would employ the same strategy, the same tactic in terms of solving, right? We, we've got coordinates for X and G, and we can just plug and chug solving for values of f of x. So doing that by plugging in those X and G values, you can get corresponding X and f of X values and because it says, it's very important, because it says that f is linear, you can then create the equation from just a pair of coordinates, right? You need one pair of coordinates, x, y, x, y, or x, f of x, x, f of x. Plug and chug, find the slope, you're good to go. Okay, quadratic polynomial and radical functions. So these are some examples from practice test five of a question where we're talking about volume. Now, the reason why I included this one is because this is, I believe from module one, question 21, I can't remember for sure. But anyways, you might be getting to this point and you're like, all right, rectangular prism, length times width times height, not a big deal. But the thing that you have to recognize is they're saying right here, this is the key, which function gives the volume of the prism in cubic inches in terms of the length, okay? So it's very important that it says the length is X, which is seven more than the width, which means, the width has to be x minus 7. Now, you could also represent this as, as the width being x and the length being x plus 7. And you'd still solve for, for the rectangular prism. You just have to know that now x represents the width, not the length. But they didn't ask for that. They didn't ask you to solve it. They asked you to set it up with x in terms of the length of the prism's base, meaning the length is x. So you have to have x 
x minus 7 for the width, and then the height of 9, which means d is the winner. All right, 22. Here's another one that's really, really interesting from question. This is also one that I solved in the uh, 38 questions. You guys got to check out that video that I dropped today, Solving the Hardest Digital SAT Math Problems. I go over this one in particular, and uh, I do it nice and, and uh, carefully. And you can kind of see the graph and how I reason through it. But this one's an interesting one. Again, look, the bottom line is, and by the way, D is the answer here. You know that A has to be less than B. The reason why we get to this conclusion eventually is because of these different descriptors. Number one, they're telling us it goes through negative 24, zero. And since there's no vertical shift, we know that that's the starting point, right? So you, you think about a radical function, it shoots off like a cannon. I kind of think, think about it like that, right? So it kind of goes boop like that or boop like that way as well. And so because uh, negative 24, zero is that point, right? We're starting at negative 24. And then it says at positive 24, we know we're going to the right. At positive 24, it's all of a sudden negative. Here it's zero, now it's negative. We know this is going down, okay? As a result, A has to be negative. What about B? What's B? Well, B, since when X is negative 24, F of X is zero, we know that B has to be positive 24. And that's how you'd go about solving something like this. We know that since A is negative and B is positive 24, um, A has to be less than B, D is the winner. Done. Moving on. And thank you guys, everybody, for joining. If you could like the video as we're going through the predictions, that'd be really helpful. It always helps the channel tremendously. Thank you, Robert. Much appreciated. The function f is defined by this, um, where, and this is from practice test six, question 22. So these ones are, are really common. They keep having questions like this, this quadratic where they give you a couple points. They say A is an integer greater than one. Okay, again, it's opening up. And again, I'm, I'm imploring you to watch this uh, hardest questions video where I actually tackle this one. You, it's everything is timestamp, so you can check it out. But the main idea is this. You want to leverage a couple things. Number one, you want to leverage the fact that, that the X value of the vertex is negative B over 2A. Number one. Number two, you want to leverage the fact that we know that the vertex is always right in the middle of the x-intercepts, meaning the x value can be found of the vertex can be found by averaging seven and negative three. Seven plus negative three is four divided by two is two. So I then know that negative b over negative b over two a, right, equals positive two, and then you can kind of go from there. You can figure out, um, you know, you can get a in terms of b, substitute in, and and kind of make your um, assessment that way. But also with these ones. It's like, which of the following could be the value of A plus B? We basically get to a point where these ones are impossible based on the fact that A plus B, I think it ends up being negative 3A. And since A is positive, A is greater than 1, there's no way that it could equal negative 3. 4 and 5 are totally out of the question because there's no way it can be positive. But it, can, it has to be less than negative 3, which means the only viable option of these four presented is negative 6. Um, yes, uh, Rostin says he hopes that the June SAT will be easier than March. Remember, easier, yeah, it sounds good, but also it changes the curve. So difficult test does not necessarily mean a bad thing. Just want to put that out there. Um, all right. Sorry, we're talking about percent questions. So the percent questions are interesting, and the reason why I'm giving these two examples is because you gotta want to be careful of the wording. When it says the result of increasing the quantity by 400% to 60 that's different from taking 400% of a quantity and getting 60. Now, if it said 400% of a quantity is 60, your answer would be 15, right? You just take four times 15 and get 60. This is different. When it says increasing the quantity by 400%, it means that you've got your quantity X and then you're adding 4X, right? You're adding 400% to that. So in that equation, you get X plus 4X, which is 5X equals 60. And then X is 12. That's why A is the winner. So that's why I highlighted this. And then this is different, right? Look at the wording here. A is 2,241% of the sum. That's literally 22.41 times um, that sum. Again, I would do this problem, but it's all in the video. Let me put it in the link just because I keep referencing this video over and over. Hold on. I'm going to pull it up right now. We just released it, as I mentioned. And... Uh, I know it's a good video because it's getting a lot of views and a lot of good engagement. I think people are pretty happy with it. So anyways, let me post it right now so you have the link. One second. 
Okay, here you guys go. So all these problems are pretty much, oh, most of these problems, I'd say all the hard ones, are gonna be found in this video with nice, careful explanations. Cause I didn't do it in real time either. I kind of slowed it down, edited it a little bit, made it more careful. So you can see in that video how exactly I did this one. Posted it in the chat for you guys. What's up, Arbakan? Geometry and trigonometry questions, okay? I definitely see these guys popping up a lot, especially because it's not a straight plug and chug into Desmos. You have to understand the geometry and the trigonometry, the diagrams, et cetera, and piece it together that way. This one I thought is a very interesting one because it comes down to similarity, all right? And you do want to be familiar with your triangle similarity theorems. You got angle, angle, side, angle, side, meaning Two sides are proportionate and the angle in between is congruent or side, side, side. All three sides can be shown to be proportionate. Now in this one, because of the vertical angles in here and here, we know that these two triangles are going to be similar. Um, and then after that, you can kind of write in your sides and create proportions accordingly based on the fact that they must be similar. But the thing to remember as well is, you know, this is the SAT. You don't have to go in and prove that they're similar, right? That's in geometry class, not here. So if your back's against the wall and you're like, are they similar? Are they not? I'm not sure. And you're and it's literally impossible to solve this without them being similar. Assume they're similar. All right. And then just set up a proportion accordingly. All right. Another one. Oops. I kind of popped up my diagram. Another one is this one. This is also in the video. So make sure to check that link if you want to see my nice careful explanation on how to do this. But this, I definitely think they're going to do stuff like this. This was wild because it has to do with external tangents being equal, which is not something that I normally see tested a lot on the SAT. But you do have to know that to, to basically solve this one. But once you get a good, so you have to un really be able to understand what they're talking about and set up a nice diagram. I do anticipate questions like this because, again, it takes Desmos out of the equation, right? So we set up this beautiful diagram and then, oops, you can start to piece this together knowing that the radius is 168. Boom, you put that there. Using the perimeter of the quadrilateral, you can figure out one of these external tangents. And then they want the, the distance between G and H. You draw a line across and you get a right triangle. Again, watch the video where I go over this in detail. That link is in there, so make sure to check it out. Uh, last but not least, this one, a rectangle is inscribed in a circle. So I also solved this one as well in the video. So this is another one. They don't give a diagram. They're talking about a rectangle inscribed in a circle, so you gotta understand what that means. They kind of describe it for you, but being inscribed inside a circle means the rectangle, the four corners of the rectangle touch the circle. I think I have a diagram, yeah. And then, we're trying to find the diameter of the circle, which happens to be the diagonal of that rectangle. So again, we're going back to right triangles, calculating the hypotenuse, Pythagorean's theorem, et cetera, et cetera. I think this one that happens to create a 30, 60, 90 is my recollection. But again, for the detailed explanation, go back and check that out. But I definitely anticipate these showing up, these geometry questions where you got to create everything. This one was an interesting one off the price test five, where it's just straight trigonometry. Um, using the unit circle and finding a coterminal angle is great, but you also have Desmos. You can just straight up plug it in, find tangent of 92 pi over three. Uh, in Desmos, it'll give you the decimal equivalent. Then you just have to go through and, and compare and contrast against all these answers, and you'll see what you, the output, the decimal equivalent is equal to negative rad three. Okay, we got a couple more here. Oops. Oh, is this the last one? Oh, this might be the last one. Okay. So this is the end of the presentation, but I do want to throw out one other thing that I do think might be showing up. So when we, here, let me open up a whiteboard here. Uh, let's see. Wait, let's go here. Okay. So one other thing that I've seen them test a lot on these recent, um, these recent processes that have been released is, let's say we have, two shapes that we know are similar, okay? Uh, let's just say squares for the sake of simplicity. And I know this side is three and this side is seven. So I can say if they're, if they're both squares, they have a three to seven ratio for the sides. Well, if I wanna know, hey, what's the ratio of the areas, okay? And this is for any two dimensional shape, not just squares, not just rectangles, not just triangles, anything. If I know, like, they both have a three to seven side length ratio, I know that the areas are going to be those same ratios squared. And that makes sense because 
two and we're talking about area we're talking about two dimensions like we're talking about one dimension right so we know that the the ratio of the areas is now 9 to 49 and if this pertained to a cube by the way if this all of a sudden became 3d right oh, is my rough 3d drawing now the volume we go back to the side length 3 to 7 but again it's three dimensions now we cube it okay so you can actually figure out the ratios based on side length of volume, if it's a, it pertains to a 3D figure, the two that are similar, or area, okay? Um, so Sanvi said, I was a little confused with this because it's meant to be a 360, 90, but the diagonal makes the angle a 45, right? I'm not sure which problem you're referring to, Sanvi. Uh, let me go back to my presentation here, one second. Let's see, 45, 40. Are you talking about this one? So this one, with this because it was meant to be a 36, 90, but the diagonal makes the angle of 45. The diagonal makes it, um, so this angle up in here is 60, that one is 30, uh, is what ends up happening. I didn't know that, but you end up figuring that out, I think, as my recollection <clears throat> when you go through this problem. So go ahead and, like, if you wanna see a detailed video on how I solved this problem, again, Click on that link that I posted in the chat. I'll post it one more time here. Let me see. Yeah, there it is. So click on that and you can kind of see how I go through it. For the second one to the last one. Yeah, you're talking about this one. Yeah, so there was no, there was no 45. There's nothing that makes it a 45. It's just straight up 30, 60, 90. Yeah. But again, it doesn't matter right away. You can pretty much the, the best way to explain it is you, I, I really think you should watch watch the video because I go through a nice detailed explanation. Those are the things that I would look out for tomorrow. Those are the things I would say to keep in mind. And after that, watch that hardest videos question, especially if you're shooting for an upper echelon score. I think it's going to be really helpful and beneficial for everybody. Um, and uh, go over the uh, review of the formulas and go over my Desmos hacks video. I think that one's going to be super useful as well, just so you can see all the ways you can use Desmos, shortcut a lot of problems. It's a phenomenal tool. Love Desmos over um, handheld calculators as well. And it's integrated in. Everybody has access to it. Okay, guys, that is it for today. Thank you guys so much. I'm really low on sleep because I was, like I said, working on that video that dropped today, again, posted the the uh, link in the chat. Please like this video if you haven't done so yet. All the likes, all the engagement, all the comments, it helps the channel tremendously. We're trying to keep growing and keep helping more and more people around the world, around the globe, around the planet do their absolute best. So all of that is huge and very beneficial. I gotta bounce, because I got a, a super, super busy day, uh, a lot of stuff to work on. So anyways, thank you guys so much for joining. Best of luck tomorrow. Knock it out. Let me know tomorrow in the comments on this video how you felt about the test, how you did, etc. Just don't post any information or content from the test. Uh, that is not allowed. But just let me know your feelings, your thoughts, what you think. And uh, that's it. I will see you guys next time. Good luck and take it easy.